Welcome to the Level Up Artist Podcast. We're your hosts, Adriana M.A. and Jackie Sanders. We are two art professionals sharing for the advice and business lessons we have learned along our creative journeys. We talk to artists, leaders, and art professionals to demystify the creative process and discover new ways to succeed as a career-minded artist. If you find value in these conversations, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find our podcast, and you'll be notified when we drop a new episode every Tuesday. So on this week's episode, we're going to be sharing our goals, hopes, and dreams for the new year. Uh, Here and there, you may have heard us mention some of these, but in this episode, we're taking a structured approach. Um, If you haven't set your goals for 2023 yet, perhaps this episode will provide some of the necessary inspiration. And as Adriana said, we are going to be going over things we may have touched on in previous episodes, but really fine tuning down what those goals are in terms of our marketing for our art business, gaining exposure, our art making practice, income streams, how they've shifted, how they may change, um, what our personal goals are, as well as just other general life goals, and picking an overall theme word for (laughs) 2023, which is always very interesting to try to encapsulate and simplify what are your goals down to one word or short phrase, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one. Yeah. So to go ahead and start from a marketing aspect, this is one thing we talk about a lot on the podcast. And of course, I'm pretty prevy to it being in digital marketing for my day job. So having marketing be one of the biggest goals for me um, and top of mind during this time of year, especially um, my big marketing goal is to continue to grow my audience as we all do um, with very intentional storytelling. Um, So I've had a lot of inspirational moments, especially when it comes to my early mornings and journaling and going through phases of writing blogs or creative concepts that I've unpacked. Um, But a lot of them honestly are just like sitting in Word documents (laughs) on my Google Drive. And I'm like, oh yeah, once I get quote unquote enough, I will release them. Or once I feel empowered to release them, I will. So that is my goal for 2023 is to just publish them, whether it's on my blog, whether it's on a social post, whether it's maybe making a short form video and putting it on TikTok and doing a voiceover. I don't know. But basically using all the concepts and journalings and um, stories that I've written about my work and unpacked and just finally releasing them um, because they're obviously not doing any good on my Google Drive. (laughs) And this comes a lot too with having sustainable and organized, intentional digital content plan. Um, So I love marketing. I get so fascinated with how you can turn one blog post into a blog post and a long form video for YouTube and a short form video for Instagram and TikTok and then social media caption and a newsletter. Like having that be part of my day job Every day I'm thinking about that. How can this one piece of content go for 10 miles, essentially? But it can also be very overwhelming. Even someone who works in this space, then applying it to your own business is very different. Um, So recommitting to having those sustainable systems and being more organized so that it's not all of these dozens and dozens of Word documents on my Google Drive of half-started ideas or even fully fleshed out ideas but ones that aren't published yet. So basically applying those into a structure plan of not only that I'm going to release them, but where and how, what form will those take? Um, With the primary focus really being, I think for 2023 will be video content, both short and long form, and finding that sweet spot of consistency that feels right to me, but also is sustainable. Um, And from a studio standpoint or from an image standpoint, making sure that the aesthetic of it is very consistent. That's one thing that's top of mind, especially when it comes to my like dress and style, (laughs) which has never been a primary focus for me. I always jokingly say like, as an artist, clothing is not how I choose to express myself and has never been a huge priority for me. But when it comes to creating video, we as all creatives know there is strength in a powerful visual brand both with our artwork, yes, and seeing those tie-throughs, but also in how we carry ourselves as creative entrepreneurs. On a video screen, people be able to recognize, oh, that's your style of dress. So try to be more intentional with that, which weirdly is probably my most intimidating goal for 2023, (laughs) which for some, it's so simple. Trying to get on like the fashion side of TikTok, not that I'm going to be like a fashionista by any means, but like, I don't know. It's always that topic that's always been somewhat vulnerable or insecure for me. So I'm going to tackle it in 2023. 
So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> how about you, Adriana? From a marketing standpoint, what are your big focuses for this year? Well, in a nutshell, my marketing strategy is to try to grow my online presence with candid and fresh content, meaning instead of planning it, which I know sounds counterintuitive because yeah. we're literally talking about planning, which could take some of the stress off, but also, I don't know. I feel like if I plan it too far ahead, then the work that I'm most excited about, the excitement has already died down, if that makes sense. You could say in a way with my art, sometimes like my favorite is the newest thing. So mm. I feel like I can capture some of that energy better if I say, this is done, post it now, moving on. As opposed to if I say I'm going to plan this out, it gives me more time to overthink things. And then they end up, like you said, in Word documents sitting somewhere in a drive. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have thousands of photos and videos that I could post on social media. And then I'm like, by the time I get around to it, I'm not excited about it anymore and I've moved on. Um, so I want to work on a way in which I can just feel like, What's my system to say, this is done. Don't ever think it just post to get it over with. I'm still excited about it. I'm still like bursting of energy with it. And it still feels relevant to what I've been doing in the last, you know, 72 hours, so to speak, as opposed to, oh, this is three months ago. And I, it's not me anymore. I'm kidding. I'm being <laughs> yeah. dramatic, but, but I think that's a good that point feeling. with like digital marketing content. And I think we talked about on previous episodes, but people typically work in like two different ways. Like that they overthink the process a lot. And so they have, it has to be like perfect and they want everything planned out. And it takes them three months to turn, as you were saying, like a picture into an actual release form of content mm -hmm. or people that would prefer to just quote unquote impulse post and just only post when they're inspired, when they have momentum. And then the consistency might not be as there as if it was scheduled. So it's always about finding that happy in between. Yeah. Of I want the middle of this too. Right. I want the middle of this too. I want it still fresh. There's still thought behind it. I don't want to just like, oh, I just did this ta -da, and it matches nothing else that I'm doing. Right. Um, so there has to be some kind of thought process behind it. For sure. And there will be some cohesive elements through it so that it still reads like a story, but I just don't want it to get too old. Basically, I procrastinated. I'm just gonna confess it. Yeah. I'm just like if I can have an extra 30 minutes painting or doing something with clay versus 30 minutes posting, I'm going to pick the making every right. time. And that's actually why y'all don't see me a lot on social media <laughs> sometimes. Cause I'm like, I'm just like, how much time do I have before I have to go home? Yeah. I could post or I could keep painting. I'm usually going to keep painting, yeah. but obviously we know that's not the right way to do it. So, um, not, there's no right or wrong way, but the efficient way to do it is to actually share it so people know what you're doing. So there's that. Um, so some of the ways in which I'm planning to do this is, or some of the focuses um, is to, I want to grow my YouTube channel, which you've all heard me, you know, kind of like gush over um, this project and start that out and have long form in there. I want to get better at videography. Um, we've also talked about that, like investing in equipment yeah. over time, not all at once. I do want to get back into social media, but at a rate that feels good. So maybe it's like selecting which days of the week I post and then anything new from the last time I posted is what I'll post and just get it over with. Yeah. Um, get it over with some terrible, but <laughs> check it off. Yeah. Just check it off the list. Um, and then I want to focus more on art collectors and art facilitators. Um, mm. I don't know if facilitator is the right word, but essentially galleries, consultants, curators, basically folks that helped connect where your art is or placemakers is another word I've heard. Um, folks that can actually see your art, they're, they might not be the ones necessarily buying it, but they might be the ones connecting you to the folks that actually connect with the art and can not just, oh, I'm gonna buy this to make my space pretty necessarily, but I'm going to buy this because I want to be caretaker of that work. Like I want to like actually hold it in my place and like have something that I can give, you know, other folks in my family later on down the road, kind of like that legacy conversation, um, which is a little bit different than, you know, if I'm making art, which is mm -hmm. just, you know, specifically for profit and that's the end of it, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I make some of those works too. Like there's nothing wrong with it, but there are some pieces that have a deeper significance for me and mm. for me it's really important for those to find the actual right people that want to know the story behind it and then actually want to keep the work for decades to come not just you know it matches my sofa this season and that's the end of it but you get nothing wrong with that but just thinking more of the longevity of it 
So that's part of where it all ties in with the marketing of that idea of I don't want to just boom, bam, here you go. You get, you know, some crappy studio photo that I took in the middle of the night when I was half tired and there's shadows everywhere. And that's it just for the sake of feeding an algorithm. Um, I'm more of the, I, I mean, I want to work, I want to post faster is what I want to say with that and just do it and overthink it less but also not so fast that the quality isn't there. Yeah. And I think that comes all back to what we talk about a lot is with intention. Mm -hmm. And so it's not posting for posting sake, Mm -hmm. because I think we both agree. And most people talk to, if you're just posting because you quote unquote have to, that might not be helpful. If you enjoy it and that's like a creative outlet for you in itself, that's amazing. But also what is that strategy or who are you trying to talk to Mm -hmm. or who's your target audience with that content? And what do they need to hear from you at this time? Do they need to learn about this new series that you are completing? Do they need to hear the story behind this one painting you've been working on? Because that makes them feel more collected to you and your work and what you represent. And then that may inspire them to highlight your work in a gallery or museum or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, So it really comes back to that with intention. I like how you point out that like not just for the algorithm, because if you're trying to post for the algorithm, not gonna do it. <laughs> even as someone who works in digital marketing, social media specifically, it is an uphill battle. The algorithm's always changing. Mm-hmm. It is always compensating for people trying to trick the algorithm. And so even if you get on a quick fad or a quick something that boosts you in the algorithm, so to speak for a week, maybe two, it's just an uphill battle. Yeah. So, but I really like making those intentional connections with your target audience, then that will always be beneficial and you'll always win. Yep. So. Yeah, I, I would definitely rather have that balanced approach, which of course is part of the battle in itself. It's yeah. like, just, just do it and with intention, but just do it. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of your, of your audience, right? Um, what kind of goals do you have in terms of basically increasing the amount of people that are looking at your work and what type of people are you looking at work and where are they looking at your work? Yeah, that's a big thing. Things. I know that's definitely been really top of mind for going into 2023 because a big focus of mine in 2022 was making the work, right? And so now it's, okay, I have this body of work and getting it out there. So I'm so excited to have three solo exhibitions already lined up for 2023, which is amazing. Um, But my big goal from an exposure standpoint is to intentionally expand my CV. So one thing that I'm doing in the beginning of the year, probably January project, is to create essentially my master list of galleries, art organizations, um, different spaces that I would at some point love to either have my work in a group exhibition, in a solo exhibition. And that way that can basically serve as my roadmap for the future. Um, whether it's networking events there, whether it's going to exhibition openings there, because that's another thing I want to be way more intentional about is going to other events this year. I think in the past two years, since we've had our studios at Art Space, it's been obviously going from a zero to a hundred of going from a home studio making work to now having a public facing studio where people come to you for events. And we have first Friday every month, which is amazing. But now I've kind of like gotten that groove under my belt and that's become our new normal, so to speak. And so now it's taking that extra intentional effort to go continue to go out to other places, go to other art openings, go to art events. Um, And so doing that activity or that, I guess, planning of, okay, in a two to three mile or hour radius around where I live, what events do I want to prioritize? And basically using that master list and then every quarter scheduling which events I'm going to, which Of course, we love a system. I'm all about it. So I think starting that and really committing to that will be super exciting um, because it's really getting in personally and getting my work in front of more people, as you said, in new spaces, reaching out to community. And also, I think that will open up to something we'll touch on later of just more partnerships out in the community. Um, But that starts with meeting people. And that's essentially all exposure is, is becoming more known for your work or you becoming more known to other people? Yeah, through some of the events we've had at ArtSpace uh, recently, we've had like some of them include collector talks or our collectors um, coming over and sharing their wisdom, which has been 
really cool. Some of which we have actually interviewed on the podcast, some of which are coming up on the podcast. Yeah. So no spoilers yet. Um, but essentially one of the things that just ties into what you just said is that idea of collectors are at these events and if they keep seeing you over and over, mm -hmm. they get to build a relationship with you. And if on top of that, not necessarily, but if on top of that, they also like your art, they might actually support you and right. try to like, you know, help you out. Um, and or maybe they don't necessarily resonate with your art or have space for it, but they might be like, actually, I know somebody that does, but you're building that relationship to where folks are more likely to then try to lend a helping hand, especially if they already love art anyway. So yeah, and it's one of those situations where, of course, you never go into any relationship, personal, romantic, professional with like these expectations. No. And so it's a two way street. Right. And it's always just seeing like seeing what happens, going out, meeting people. Maybe some of them could be guests on our podcast. Some could be art friends that we do studio visits with. Some could be collectors. Some could be gallery owners. And especially as an extroverted creative, I am super excited to prioritize that. Um, prioritizing those events again now that people are having them on a regular basis. Um, and obviously, it's a big time commitment and does require planning, especially as a full-time artist with a full-time day job who is also balancing a personal life and relaxation time, like adding a time commitment is never easy, but planning it and prioritizing it, I'm super excited for. And just to see what happens from some of those relationships or discovering a new gallery that I'd never been to before and meeting new artists that I'd never heard of. Yeah, you Sounds never great. know. Some of those events might be attended by gallery owners or curators or art consultants, yeah. art collectors, um, people that will eventually be fans of your work, you right. know, um, and the folks that need something that matches on top of the sofa. Like yeah. there too. So um, and a lot of artist friends. Right, yeah, that you get I, also, to make. I also just love being like an artist fangirl. I feel like whether it's on social media or in person, like I'm always going to be everyone's hype woman, like <laughs> community over competition to the max. I'm just like, you're doing amazing. Like, keep it up. Or how then we can now serve as those connectors to people. Oh, have you heard of this person? You guys would get along great or connecting one artist to another opportunity. Um, I think that would be, it's, it's super beneficial. It's just like the best thing ever. <laughs> uh, from an exposure standpoint, what are you looking at? What are you prioritizing? Um, I'm looking to increase the variety of events and exhibitions that I attend. Um, so. I have several exhibitions already booked for the year and a lot of them are in the first couple of months of the year, which is insanity, um, including a big solo show. So I'm super excited about that. Looking forward to it. We're still hashing out as of the time of this recording, kind of like all the different events that go with the solo show. So more to come on that. Um, but that's, that's really exciting. Um, I also want to be more intentional about documenting and sharing when I go to these events, yeah. even if it's just a reel, even if it's just a blog post or a YouTube video, just, you know, sharing a little bit of it, almost like um, week in the life of an artist type scenario. So mm -hmm. it could have like more snippets where I can share more. Um, I don't know. I'm looking forward to doing a little bit more of that. I'm not saying I'm going to be like art journalist or anything like that. I do know a few artists that are like that. One of them, I'm like, I'm not going to mention names, but I'm like, if you're listening to this, I know you know who you are. Yeah, uh, you go I to definitely... every event. You go to every event and <laughs> you tell us about everything that's going on. Anyways, I love people like that too. Oh, I um, need to get that person's account. Oh, I, I will let you know. Because... I just did that when I was up in Baltimore and it was so fun. I visited like the Baltimore Museum of Art and like documented it with my friend Aaron, like shared it on social media. And I feel like that's so fun. Yeah. Definitely on my radar too. Just like, yeah, we've the done that in the past too. Like our artist dates, like, yeah. Join us as we're going to like these four different galleries. Exactly. Third Friday. And exactly. And the artist in question, I haven't asked permission, which is why I'm not mentioning names, but if she's listening, I know she'll know. Um, <laughs> and then, um, I want to do more art related events. So much like you, I have like this running list that I've been building over the last two, three years of like different places in our area that have different kinds of events. Mm -hmm. What I haven't done is I try to be very intentional about what I go to. So you're extroverted, I'm introverted. So I have to pick very carefully what I go to and also protect my energies around it of like, would I rather finish this painting or would I rather go to this networking event? Now, usually if it's a artist, specific one I'm comfortable because I'm like those are my people and we're all going to nerd out and if I start talking about Canacrid and Magenta nobody's going to judge me and they actually know what it means possibly Maybe. but <laughs> if I go to more of a 
say like an event where I feel like, oh, you have to dress up and, you know, it's wine and cheese cubes. And um, do you know about the artist, oeuvre, you know, their body of work and all those things? I'm like, mm. uh, like I have to, uh, what's the term mask? I think is the term used, but I have to like put on that mask of like, be a chameleon in the space. Yeah. 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 And like, and I have to dress up and uh, it takes a little bit longer to, for me to like, get ready for something like that it also takes me longer to recover from something mm. like that um so it's not bad but i have to be very intentional about which ones i go to and which ones i'm like no i'd rather just paint like a you know i don't know i'm kind of a hermit anyway <laughs> um <laughs> let's be real but speaking of making and hermitage and all those things anyways some of our goals are related to the actual making itself because mm. obviously it's great to go to all those events but like you mentioned it takes time not just to get ready for them, recover for, from them. Sometimes there's driving distances, especially if it's several mm -hmm. cities over. Um, it it can be disruptive to our routine. Um, so obviously we have to be mindful of that, but they can lead to wonderful opportunities. So it's not something to be discounted either. But in terms of the art making itself, what are some of your goals for this upcoming year? 500 paintings. I mean, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel like with... Over the years, I've accumulated and well invested in a lot of panels. If there's like good sales or there's a new scale I want to explore, I invest in it. And so I don't make paintings quick enough to go through that inventory of blank panels that are waiting to become masterpieces. So that's <laughs> definitely an intentional focus within 2023 of using the materials I do have, whether it's a paint that I purchased a while ago, whether it's a panel size, um, whether it's a paper, um, so really utilizing what I have in my space, I think was an interesting challenge because often we can get very like shiny object syndrome or this new thing, new thing, new thing, um, which of course is a financial investment if you don't already have it. Um, but also using these as like, oh, it may be a quote unquote limitation. Let's say if I only have 18 inch panels, but okay, well, this is now my, if you think of it as a class assignment, as a school assignment, you have to make a series of nine paintings that are all 18 inch squares. Okay. And like, what would that series look like? Um, and so I'm excited to explore that, especially now as I'm going more into bridging that gap between painting and sculpture, I think is the overall theme that I see in my art making practice. Um, throughout the years, I've done a lot of studies with sculptures, like freestanding sculptures in a, let's say in a gallery, you would basically put on like a pedestal. Um, but they've all just been experiments or studies, never actually quote unquote completed pieces. A lot of them exploring similar themes of light and shadow that I have in some of my work. But I'm excited to continue pushing that and exploring it, as well as bridging that gap between my large panel paintings with sculpture, incorporating wood, incorporating 3D elements. Um, so I'm excited about that for sure. The biggest challenge I think that I'm most nervous about <laughs> is pretty much for the past, I would say, at least three years honestly, probably 10 years. There's only two paintings that I can think of that were non-squares, um, which I just like the balance of it. Being a geometric artist, I love the square. You can do a lot compositionally with it. But in 2021, I believe, I invested in some large scale canvases that are not squares. And so I have six of those. So I wanna challenge myself to not only explore painting on canvas versus panel, um, but also a non-square versus square. So it's changing two massive elements at once. Um, I tried it this year and then I didn't really like how it turned out. Um, or didn't like, not didn't like how it turned out. I liked the final piece, but I wasn't inspired enough to continue exploring it. Um, but I'm excited to go back to it in 2023 and see what happens. Again, because I also, their canvases I already have, so. That as well. The only wasted art material is the material that's not that you don't use. So granted, canvases don't go bad, panels don't go they bad. Can, if they can. Mold. True. And when you think of like a paint, I feel like in the past I've also had that where maybe you make a big financial investment in this paint, or it's you see it as this pre precious object. You're like, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm not ready for that yet. And then you open it up four years from now <laughs> and it dried out anyway. And you're like, well. I should have just freaking explored it and painted with it and it would have been fine because <laughs> it's better than being a hard lump in this bottle. So trying to go in with that mindset, not being scared of these precious objects. 
It depends the quality of it too, to be yeah. honest. Because I'm like, I've gotten golden paints in metal tubes from another artist who was like, no, I don't like these. You can have them. And they were probably at least 10 years old and they were fine. Yeah. Um, but then I've also had other paints, also high quality paints. And if there was like a tiny pinhole crack in it or yeah. the lid wasn't all the way over, it's like you said, it's like this lump of plastic, essentially. And with oils, oh gosh, some of them leak. And anyways, it it's can, a whole it can mess. Be a thing. Yeah. So that's definitely a good tip. If you're an artist and haven't done it recently, do a survey of what materials you have. Go through all those bins that are under tables that are from old workshops or whatever. Like take an assessment of what you have and then either choose to use it this year, choose to make a series based around that. Maybe that's a through line or exchange with an artist. If you know you're never going to use that material, either donate to another artist, exchange it with another artist. So it doesn't become like a sad little shriveled up piece of art material. It actually <laughs> gets to have a new life in a painting. So when you're looking to 2023, what does your art making practice look like? What are some of your goals? Well, I did something I did change is I used to have this goal of three paintings a week. Um, that's much harder to implement because I'm still exploring the intersection between paintings and ceramics and I want to continue to do so. And ceramics takes so long from beginning to end. Maybe if I had a tiny baby kiln, that would be different. But generally I have to have enough pieces in before I can fire the first time and then the second time. So saying three a week is not very realistic, honestly. Um, and I found, and this happens with paintings too, I don't want to be like, start three things a week because then it piles up what hasn't gotten finished. Yeah. So I'm still working out what that parameter looks like and trying to give myself more grace of like, I'm still in that development, like research and development part of it as these ceramics continue to expand my body of work and continue to be an interpretation of the message in my paintings, but in a different media and in a different dimension. So that's a little bit different. It's more of a continue to balance the two. So it's not just painting and it's not just ceramics because this uh, in 2022, there was a part of the year where there was no painting. It was mostly ceramic. So it's um, incorporating the two. So every week there will be both in my art practice. Um, I also want to continue exploring going larger. Uh, so with paintings, I've continued to, of course, but also with the ceramic side, it again carries from a technical standpoint, which I'm not going to go into that nerd, nerd uh, detour, but um, there's a lot more to think about the bigger you go with ceramics and the weight of it. And is it going to warp? Is it going to be too heavy? And I have this vision of having these pieces that could go into hotels and you know, law firms and building lobbies and things like that. So they're large scale ceramics, but it's also, okay, how am I going to transport this in a way that it doesn't break? How are we going to install it? How are we going to store it in between? Um, how long is it actually going to take to fire this piece? Is it going to take a year to make this one thing? Um, it, there's a lot of logistics that I'm still figuring out with it, but I haven't given up on that vision. That's one of my big goals is to figure out how to do it. So right now, some of the initial sketches I'm doing is to make smaller versions of it and then see what it looks like, see if I love it, and then try to make a bigger mm. version, almost in a way so that if I'm going to propose this to a firm, a company, a nonprofit, whatever it is, whoever I'm working with um, that wants to invest in this thing, then I can show them a prototype, have them approve that so they can see if they can touch it. And then we can talk, okay, give me a deposit so that then I can buy 5,000 pounds of clay to make this thing out of, you know what yeah. I mean? So it's like, instead of doing it and then trying almost like a painting, right? You do a thing and then you try to find who is the right person for it. It's the other way around. It's not quite exactly the same as a commission, but almost in the sense, I'm the one that's creating the work, a smaller version, and then asking someone to commission the larger piece of it that would then be customized to their space. So mm. it's somewhere in between, as opposed to someone saying, I have this wall, make something for it. And then you only work with their parameters. In this case, right. I'm already bringing the concept and then applying their parameters. So it's actually a partnership collaboration. Yeah, I love so that. I'm looking forward to that. And along those same lines, it's also doing more public art. Um, so murals and other large scale painting projects, mm. which much in the same way, like if there's a call for art for a mural, they're going to say there's this wall. So that's already one of the parameters. And you're showing them a sketch of what you think would go in there. And then there's a feedback loop with it. Of mm -hmm. can you make this bigger? Can you make this a different color? Can so much in the same way as the ceramic one, 
except the biggest difference is like I'm already familiar and very comfortable with painting. So it doesn't have the same kind of, it does have some technical things and logistics to think about, but not on the same scale um, as yeah. like going on site to do a painting as opposed to I have to fire all these things and then I have to ship them and make sure they don't break and I have to have extras and then yeah. I install it and can the wall hold 500 pounds. Like it, there's a lot yeah. more involved versus a larger scale painting, but that's one of the things. Um, and this all ties in not just to purely the art making practice itself, but also that conversation that we have of diversifying our income streams. Mm -hmm. So it's like, could I have, and we've had, you know, like it's that idea too of like, do you want to be more volume driven as opposed to have a few larger projects and then some smaller things in between? Like, what does that balance look like? So for me, I'm like, instead of being volume wise, I'm exploring that idea of could I have say three or four large projects a year, which will take a long time, but those pay all my bills essentially, like pay my studio rent, all my materials, those four big projects. So that then the other projects in between pieces that I'm creating and whatnot that are smaller don't have the same kind of financial pressure tied to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm free to explore a little bit more. And of course, I also want to find them homes and things like that. But it's trying to find that balance of a few bigger things, bigger ticket items, so to speak, to help kind of balance it out. Um, because eventually what I'd like to do, and again, it does tie in into the income side, what I'd like to eventually do is if I can get some consistency regarding some of those bigger projects and the kind of income they can bring in, then I want to move to a model in which I pay myself out of that money in the following year, like literally give myself a paycheck. I'm not at that point yet. Right now it's like I make something, I sell it, and then I use part of it to pay my bills and then part of it to grow my business. Right. And I'm like- Reinvesting I'd, back into your business. Exactly. But I'd rather change it to where it's like every week I get a paycheck. Yeah. But in order to do so, I need those kind of big ticket projects that I can then like figure out how much they made for the year and then use that to budget my own paycheck the following year. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. So that, no, that does that make sense. A little confusing. But. And I think that is a great way of thinking of when it comes to income streams. I know that is top of mind for both of us because mm -hmm. all creatives know that like from an income standpoint, typically things do ebb and flow. If you have a big project or if you receive a grant or if you have a big commission, then like one second, you're just like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I have X amount of income. Like how great would it be if I got this every week or every month or whatever your time frame is? And then we have those seasons where we're like, oh my goodness, how am I going to make rent this month? I have nothing in the pipeline. It feels like no one's reaching out. No one's responding. Like what's going on? So like we've all experienced those highs and lows. And so it's finding that consistent sweet point to where you're not super stressed during the down times, but at least where I am now being beginning of January, it's after celebrating those highs in quarter four and with the holidays, I'm definitely still financially frugal, so to speak, uh, of understanding that with the high of the holidays from an income standpoint, then typically is a dip for me and how my business is in January, February, um, because I haven't planned to have anything come down the pipeline. Yeah, there's relationships that may turn into people purchasing original paintings or doing any projects um, that may quote unquote come out of the blue where really you planted the seed six months ago and they're just get back to you. But from an income standpoint, that's also something that's very top of mind for me is that consistency element. And so I've really been pulled towards teaching in the new year, which I'm really excited about. Um, not so much from an art making standpoint for me, I think maybe just because I went through academia and getting my master's and doing group critiques, which I love, but I don't necessarily feel called to lead others in that way, but more, for, for, more so from the marketing standpoint and sharing systems and sustainability practices and organization that I, that's my default mode. That's where I thrive. Like if I have 30, 40 minutes to quote unquote kill, like I will love to like batch make content for social media. I'll write a blog post, make a newsletter. Like I love that stuff. And so how can I make the systems that I have made in order to be consistent there and help other artists do the same? So I really want to dive more into those classes starting in 2023. Um, and again, doing partnerships with other organizations, I think will be fun. Um, and also from an income standpoint, 
I'm excited to reevaluate a lot of the products that I offer. Um, so when you think of income streams, what things are we going to like continue? What things are we going to add? And what things are we going to shift? I'll be continuing paintings, of course, um, and adding in more workshops, more maybe in-person classes, maybe virtual classes. Not sure how it's going to look yet. There's a few conversations happening. But then also from a reevaluating standpoint, there's some products that I have that maybe shifting um, the focus of them, maybe expanding objects. Um, so I'm excited to see what that looks like and really looking at those from a profitability standpoint, but also a messaging standpoint. I think the two words we've recorded episodes in the past about art products specifically, both original products and reproducible products. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are interested in that, listen to those episodes. But um, it is always good having time to reevaluate and check in on them. Mm -hmm. of, are they still serving the same purpose? Am I still feeling connected to it? Do they make sense financially? Um, have things shifted? And so that's one of my big quarter two projects in the new year is to focus on reevaluate, expand that product line. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, products, I've put them on the shelf for a little bit. This um, the last 12 months or so. Um, and I'm also reevaluating what I want to bring back or not. So like stickers, stickers always sold well. So I may bring stickers back. Prints, maybe. Like I'm still considering whether or not I want to do it and how I want to do it. Yeah. So there's several things like that when it comes to products where I'm like, is the number one investment in time to set it up worth it for me personally, right? Everybody obviously for you, they're successful. But for me, I'm like trying to decide and also trying to figure out what those profit margins look like and if it's quote unquote worth the trouble let's just put it that way but I'm not against them or anything like i think it's a great way to you know make money from something that can be reproduced mm -hmm. it's also like does it go in line with the other things that i'm making and how does it all tie in together so that's that's all part of it but uh, another way that i'm looking at in terms of income streams like diversifying them is adding additional service specifically for other artists um, I know you mentioned some, you know, business and marketing things myself as well. So not just for say technology, which is something that, you know, I help people with anyways, but also with the art practice itself. So when I was starting out, something that I found extremely helpful as someone that did not go to art school was to actually get mentored by other artists who were like, okay, here are some basically like challenges to yourself. This is an exercise we're going to do. Here's how we're going to cohesify your body of work. Here's how we're going to narrow down what your style is and things like that. And getting that kind of guidance was honestly a game changer for me. So um, being like practicing what that's like and using some of those same parameters whenever I'm creating a new series or body of work and also talking to other artists in different levels has led me to go with, okay, let me try to do this for somebody else and you know, help them out too, right? So that's something that I'm looking forward to doing a little bit more of, but in a more formal setting. So not just a studio visitor that I'm trying to help out for just a few minutes, but actually in a more structured approach. Um, so that's something that I'm looking forward to. And then I'm also adding more courses and workshops, both in ceramics and painting. So it's both the art practice and business side, but also like the actual making stuff. Now, these are not a paint like me or um, one of those like wine shop places wine and design. The, i don't want to mention any names so <laughs> i just did we're not throwing shade on wine and design for hey i worked there it was I know. great it was fun uh -huh. i got one of my first jobs from wine and design well there great. you go there yeah. you go well i'm not looking to do that where it's like here's something already with lines drawn out and then you fill it in while you get booze uh yeah. not that not that <laughs> it's not yeah so i know that was a lot um <laughs> but I think there's some overarching themes and what we're talking about. And obviously, you know, a quick, a quick pause is to say, it's not like we're trying to jam all these things. And, you know, by June 1st, all these things have to be accomplished. Not all of them are measurable either, but it's just to give you a general sense of what we're planning for. It's a separate conversation then for us to figure out what dates these things we would like to accomplish them by. I know you mentioned for events, putting them in the calendar yeah. and trying to figure out to have the bandwidth to go or not, depending if there's a conflict. So there's that. But with all that being said, have you identified some kind of theme, word, phrase that you are hoping 2023 will align with, so to speak? Yeah, I think I kind of have two. So the first one being like my approach to projects and my goal slash theme is going to be do less, <laughs> which 
I've talked about before, like kind of seems counterintuitive, but I'm someone who goes like a million miles a minute or has very high expectations of timelines for myself. And so typically my goal is essentially to do what I think would take me one day. I'm going to allow myself to block off a week to do it. Um, because realistically, that's probably how long it actually takes. But I keep being like, oh, why haven't I gotten this done yet? Why haven't I gotten this done yet? So whatever takes could take me what I think takes a day may take me a week. If I think it'll take me a week, let me block off the month. And that's my monthly goal. Um, but then also exploration and expansion. I think from my art making process, being able to explore, kind of be a beginner again in this new sculpture overarching theme in my paintings that I'm excited to explore. Um, but also with new exhibitions, going out, networking, attending events, that's exploration in itself, kind of getting in deeper with the local arts community, getting to know it more. Um, and then same with partnerships, how I can explore other organizations, but also partner with them um, and expand our collective reach together. So doing less by being more intentional, um, but also exploration and expansion. So how about you? So for me, I think the, the, the words that I associate with it is sustainable expansion is kind of what I'm going with. Yeah, that's um, a good phrase. Yeah, yeah. Almost like, yes, I want to grow, grow my income, grow my exposure, grow and evolve my art making practice but also not at a speed that will feel or could lead to burnout. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's where I'm like, if I had to narrow it down in terms of like what this master plan uh, looks like is uh, video and creating video and content for a focused audience, which we talked about art collectors and art related folks as well. Connectors. Let's go with that. Um, exhibiting more, going to larger scale projects or adding more larger scale products to the mix, uh, teaching and mentoring to share forward with other artists, um, prioritizing rest, but actually like not just talking about it, doing it. Um, and then having that mindset of just add a little bit at a time, evaluate your results, evaluate how you feel about it, and then actually like, don't feel like you have to rush because much like you, I'm like, ooh, it's it's like that idea. If I could accomplish this, let me take a step back. Let me put it this way. I have this thing where if I think I can accomplish a task in a certain amount of time, that is the deadline that I give it without necessarily regarding all the other things that are on the table. So if I'm like, I know I can finish kind of like that goal that is no longer a goal for this year, three paintings a week. No matter what else I'm doing, I'm going to try to accomplish through a week when realistically I should look at it more holistically and say, well, this week, actually, I'm going to be out of town two days and then I have this event and then there's this project I'm working on. Making three this week is not necessarily realistic, so I shouldn't feel bad about it if I don't like I right. need to be a little more flexible with it. So I'm trying to apply that, especially for 2023. That's the part where the sustainability side comes in is to say. Just because I can do it in that time frame doesn't mean I should expect myself to do it in that time frame. Right. That's like it's, great. Yeah. It's good to have a goal and be, you know, obviously like keep yourself accountable for it, but also don't be too harsh about it. If, if other things come in the way, because they're always going to come in the way and you don't need the guilt anyway. Yeah. And understanding that like priorities do change. I think that's mm -hmm. a constant theme of prioritizing, reprioritizing, reevaluating, and commit to your goals, whether for the year, whether for the quarter, whether for the month, and then say, okay, after two weeks, after a month, whatever, I'm going to sit with this goal, as you said, look at the results, evaluate, reevaluate, and change what that goal is moving forward. Mm -hmm. So these are definitely overall themes for 2023. I'm sure by the end of 2023, they may have grown or changed or expanded in themselves, but it's always good to go in with intention to the new year. Yeah. And speaking of intention, I think another, you know, little tidbit to, to add to this is I think as you set these goals, I think have the intention to reevaluate them at least every three months, honestly, yeah. like, especially if you do this where it's not just uh, something you do on the side, which is fine. Like if you're just doing this for fun, that's great. But obviously, you know, our, our goal with this podcast is to, you know, specifically help out other career minded folks. So if that's you think of it as, like you said, things change, be flexible. But as you set this goals, instead of going, I will accomplish all these by the end of the year, 
try to figure out as you go through these, which of these do you want to tackle first? Mm -hmm. Knock them off the list, reevaluate what you still have left. That way they don't pile up at the end of the year of, I only did these three things out of 12. Now I only have in the middle of the holiday season, which is the busiest, let me try to knock out the other nine. Yeah. That's not realistic. And then you're going to perhaps, I don't know about you, but I feel bad if I'm like, oh, this got on the back burner. This one's rolling over to another year. This one, I don't know what I'm doing with it. Um, but instead, I feel like if you do set these up, because I know it's a lot that we talked about, try to reevaluate them at least every three months, at twice a year, and then try to determine what you keep and what you get rid of. Exactly. Don't need to keep all that. But yes, with that, we hope you really enjoyed this episode. As always, our blog will be linked in today's show notes. We can find episode notes and links to our other podcast episodes. If you want to stay connected with us in between episodes, you can find me online um, at Amay Art across all platforms. And I'm at Jay Sanders Studio on all platforms. Or if you want to stay connected to the podcast, we are Level Up Artists on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening. Happy New Year. And we'll talk to you next week.